Okay, one more go taking a look at the um, way in which a country becomes developed. And we're going to keep the same question, central question at the top. But rather than looking at models, we're going to look at some other just specific methods or ways that a country becomes developed. One of those being um, rather simplistic in its, in its idea is just that it's called foreign direct investment. This is a, finance, a way of financing development. This is when a company from one country enters the economy of another country. So when a company, this doesn't necessarily mean outsourcing. It doesn't necessarily have to mean that you're um, taking business from your own country, ending that business and moving it to another country. But rather, you're simply engaging directly in the economy of a foreign country. Um, one of the key, key examples of that in modern day is China's foreign direct investment in Africa. Now the bottom graph, or excuse me, the bottom map is from 2005, so it's outdated, but it certainly shows us um, the extent to which China's companies are directly involved in investment in Africa. There was sort of a contentious headline I saw recently that said, um, that was a, a reference to China's uh, new, the new scramble for Africa. Um, scramble for Africa, of course, being a reference to the Conference of Berlin, where the country, the borders of African nations were arbitrarily drawn by European colonizing powers. The uh, headline is a reference to the idea that China is now gobbling up um, a lot of the natural resources via uh, direct foreign direct investment, where they've got companies coming in and employing people, um, either bringing in Chinese workers themselves to work within China, or investing in uh, businesses themselves. Now, again, that's contentious. That's, that's, that's essentially an argument that China is doing something um, bad, which uh, you know is up to your own individual discretion. But the idea here is that you can see China's placing enormous investment in, in African businesses. You can see in the... Um, on the African economy, I should say. You can see up there in the top that the rest of, in foreign direct investment in Africa in 2012, you can see that China um, has, a, has a decent portion for there, but you can see what, by um, the growth in 2015, in 2013, I mean, just an enormous amount of Chinese presence and Chinese businesses in, in Africa this time. Another way to get financing um, is rather not through um, businesses, but through loans. Um, that, that's the purpose of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, also known as the IMF. There's also a, regional, a couple of regional examples. One's called the Asian Development Bank, and another's called the Inter-American Development Bank. One obviously was with Asia, the other's obviously for the Americas. But these are institutions that provide countries with loans. And those loans are then used for, um, for the development. And it seems perfectly logical in its nature, but the problem with the, 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 or the problem, the criticism that these institutions often face is that these institutions um, are accused of manipulating um, these LDCs to do as these, as the countries see fit. So for example, a lot of the loan, not all, but some of the loans that are provided by the IMF and the World Bank are called structural adjustment loans. And what that means is the loan is conditional on something. So something has to happen in order for the country to gain access to the loan um, or to the money. That, that, that sometimes is very logical and good. It could be something like you can no longer, I mean, I'm, this is a hypothetical example, but you can no longer give arms to these terrorist groups in your country or you must sign X and Y agreement to, lo to limit your industrial pollution and then in turn we will provide you with this money. Seems, it often seems good. It's a dub typically done with good intentions, but it's often, um, a lot of people criticize the IMF and the World Bank, as you see from that um, from that graphic down there, that a lot of people accuse them just as sort of keeping the rich rich and the poor poor. Um, moreover, LDCs often have a hard time repaying loans, just on the whole, whether it's a structural adjustment loan, a micro loan, microfinancing loan, they're just, um, if you don't have a strong economy, then loans often are a dangerous or slippery slope because if you can't repay them, then the interest accrues over time and so on and so forth. So people often, um, a statement that you'll hear is that debt is a way to keep the poor countries poor, poor, countries poor that by, by offering these loans and in these investment opportunities, they just simply uh, enter a cycle of poverty. Is that entirely true? No. But is there some, some truth to the idea that um, this is giving MDCs economic control? I think that's a valid, valid idea. You can see here, uh, just to, to, to add to the, or to further this idea of sort of cyclical nature and, and poor, poor, rich, rich, that here's an idea of the, or look at the foreign debt, so the percentage of the countries that have foreign debt. And you can see with um, those Latin, the Central and Latin American countries, um, you can see on the whole is actually largely a reflection of the development, so the, the fast growth um, that's being that's that these regions are experiencing and the loans they're taking out to do so, um, but sadly, some of the countries that are in the most debt are the ones who are least able to repay those loans.
Um, lastly, last way that countries often become developed is through tourism. Um, tourism is often used to drive development, but it comes at high costs. Um, so, for example, uh, you know, for on the whole, people often say, "Well, tourism is good. It drives businesses. It bring, brings in money, and it can help the country provide some sort of valuable resource." It, which is to an extent true, but it often it comes with a lot of a lot of baggage. So, for example. In order for tourism to be a successful industry, the host country needs to, use, to invest an enormous amount of resources, of infrastructure, of time into that industry. So, for example, if you consider um, the development of hotels, you know, there's a lot of beautiful beaches in the equatorial zone of the world. So if you're going to these beautiful beaches, well, then this host country needs to develop um, the roads, the road systems. They need to develop the water lines. They need to, you know... We Americans, we like our internet, we like our cable, we like all of those things. That all requires infrastructure. There need to be cable lines laid, there need to be internet wires, there needs to be reliable internet, there needs to be, which in turn means that you need to have sources of energy that are consistent and reliable. So there's a lot of these scarce commodities, so the, the things that you can buy, and resources, food and water, that are be driven into the development of businesses for tourists, and not actually on the people or the place themselves. Um, so I'm um, sorry. Actually, no, that's not typo. We're good. Um, so tourism can be it can be good. I mean, as I says at the top, one, turning one billion tourists into one billion opportunities. This is just sort of a from um, a UN tourism organization that's promoting it, and it's not all bad. It's certainly not. It definitely provides uh, job opportunities for some, and it definitely provides um, some economic growth and drives economic growth for many countries. It really is the core of a lot of um, of the lesser developed countries of the world, but. We can't, they can't, we can't overlook who it is that's actually benefiting and who it is that's getting the money. So, for example, the transnational companies, so companies that are uh, companies of, L of MDCs, but transnational, of course, meaning they go across multiple countries. These are the ones that own the hotels and the facilities, and ultimately it's these companies that are reaping the profits. Not that much different than the agribusinesses that we discussed um, in that unit. So tourism, is, it can be, it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a bit of a, a tricky way to develop because it it can, it can be helpful, but it can also come with a lot of costs. Um, another example, just to further that, you can see here, this is a picture of the favelas in Brazil. So the favelas are the slums that we'll um, study, and that's a rough term, but the underdeveloped regions, for sure, um, of, the, um, of the cities, particularly in the favelas is a reference to uh, Brazil, and this is in Rio de Janeiro. You can see the, just the juxtaposition between the favelas and these high... Um, these skyscrapers um, that are likely hotels and many of these things that are driven for tourism. The people that work in the, these tourist industries, it's also in menial labor, meaning uh, low-skilled labor, and often are provided low wages, perhaps better than what they were, would get um, in a subsistence agricultural living, no question. But this is not exactly a way to drive a tertiary society. Tourism is not going to ensure that your entire society is experiencing growth. Um, it can also change the culture and the cultural landscapes to accommodate the tourists. So, for example, the cultural practices may be either put to the side or things that people don't necessarily like to see in a culture, um, maybe just sort of shielded or minimized if it's not going to promote tourism. The cultural landscape itself, what we see, it's going to become more homogenous. There can be more McDonald's, more Western types of building, more Western um, architecture, anything that's going to be accommodating or make tourists uh, drive, make, encourage tourism at all. So we were, we're losing some of the cultural distinctions between places as tourism rides. That can, rises. That can also lead to social tensions. It can also lead to problems between people on um, the people of the country versus the tourists who are there or the people of the country who are not benefiting from tourism and the people who are. So t again, tourism can be, can be a little bit tricky. Um, one of the things that is a response to the changes to the cultural landscape is people are developing what's known as ecotourism. And this is a form of tourism based upon the enjoyment of the scenic areas or natural wonders. That, um, and the idea here is that rather than doing this, where you're changing a whole landscape, or you can th consider... Um, if any of you have ever had the privilege of going somewhere like Cancun or seen pictures where you just have these massive, massive hotels, one after the other after the other for miles and miles and miles on beaches, um, a lot of people. I mean, a lot of people argue you're destroying the natural landscape itself. Or you, if you have lots and lots of tourists coming to a specific, uh, I don't know, snorkeling destination, then that's going to change the reef. So what we what we have here is this is a this is aiming. The ecotourism is a new branch of tourism where people 
are trying to cater to tourists with a natural environment and a culturally in a culturally sensitive and economically excuse me in culturally sensitive and environmentally sustainable way so um, minimizing the impact upon the, the natural landscape and that's very that's growing really Costa Rica is sort of the, the, the um, pioneer of many of those different um, industries okay two quick uh, analysis questions and that is it for us